and welcome everybody to a new video from Juggler 66 Hour of the Truth. This is today the 17th recording I do of the wonderful book reading from Edmond Paris, um, The Secret History of the Jesuits. I'm still clicking a little bit around here with the different cameras because I'm not used to this and a little bit earlier this afternoon or this evening I had a sound problem so I want to make sure everything is working when I start the recording right now. Anyway, uh, we're going to continue in that book from Edmond Paris and uh, we have come last time to uh, the part um, where we were reading about De Grey and uh, what there was to say everything about the German involvement. Now we only have two and a half pages, uh, almost three pages left in this uh, chapter of the book and then I will switch to another book as I already announced to you this one chapter 7 of uh, the secret terrorists World War 2 and we will probably read both of these today in this session yeah, I'm, at least I'm gonna try right now to do so so without any further ado I will give to you the next reading of uh, the secret history of the Jesuits by Edmond Paris and we're going to start here uh, on the top where it is marked in Belgium itself. The author says Cardinal van Rooij allowed one of the most famous priests of Flanders, his greatest Catholic intellectual, Abbe Verschave, declare on the 7th of November 1940 during a solemn session of the Senate and in the presence of a German general, President Reda, quote, it is the duty of the Cultural Council to build the bridge which will unite Flanders and Germany. <laughs> Unquote. Yeah, unite Germany and Flanders, and then you already have the first step to a united Europe. You know, what we have today, the European Union, were the plans of Hitler, but Hitler did that with military might or power and did not succeed because they didn't want him to succeed. They wanted the Germans to be punished. And now they did it politically, because people don't just see that coming. They see, oh, we have the euro, what a wonderful life, we can all pay with one currency. Yeah, it's not even a currency. It is the duty of the Cultural Council to build the bridge which will unite Flanders and Germany. So, it is probably the duty of Pontifex Maximus, the supreme bridge builder, to build the bridge which will unite all of Europe. You can also read it this way. Okay, on the 29th of May 1940, the day after the surrender, of Belgium that is, Cardinal van Rooij described the invasion as a kind of present from heaven. Quote, Be sure, he wrote to the faithful, that we are witnessing at the moment an exceptional intervention of divine providence which is displaying its power through great events. When you read all these words, I mean, you understand all these words as they are written and commented by this bishop, then you are, or cardinal, then you absolutely understand that as well as the German Third Reich, the Nazis, Hitler's Reich, was Catholic, as the leadership in Belgium was Catholic. So they had nothing but brave words for that. Of course, they welcomed it because it is another Catholic power usurping another Catholic power, the greater Germany usurping the smaller, Belgium. Yeah. That's the point. And then they call it divine providence, which is displ displaying its power through great events. The quote continues here, so after all that, Hitler seemed to be nothing less than a purifying instrument providentially chastising the Belgian people. Unquote. Yeah, chastising the Belgian people, what Belgian people? Well, the Belgian people who were liberals, Catholic liberals, like the Catholic liberals over there in the United States of America. If the Catholics of the United States of America think they are real Catholics, they have, they ain't seen nothing yet, I tell you. And that will come into the future. The real Catholic is a Catholic who adheres to the Council of Trent, a Trentine Catholic. Yeah? That's the worst kind, the ultramontane, the absolutely uh, fundamentalistic. 
you can call it. They are fundamentalistic in their views. They are the ones that not only found the Inquisition, but ran the Inquisition and run it still. Yeah? And so the author says here, or the, the, uh, the quote goes here, that is from uh, De Gre one of the Grell's books here, Hitler seemed to be nothing less than a purifying instrument providentially chastising the Belgian people. Meaning, get rid of any opposition, get rid of any liberalism and make them as fanatic and fundamental as the Catholic Germans were under the rule of the Roman Catholic Church under Trentine dogma. Something very similar, the author continues, was happening in our own country, speaking of France, of course, where we were constantly reminded that, quote, defeat is more fruitful than victory. <laughs> As before 1914, when a purifying thorough bleeding was wished upon France. Also in these memoirs, which fell, or rather were thrown, into the oubliette, meaning for forgetness, we find some very interesting details concerning the Burenbond, the great Catholic and political and financial machine of Cardinal van Rooy, which largely financed the Flemish, the Flemish section of Louvain's university. The Burenbond is the uh, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, how do you say that? Uh, a bond is a union, uh, so it's it's the uh, it's the farmers' union. That's the Burenbond union. I didn't come to that word. Excuse me. So it's the farmers' union, the great Catholic and political and financial f machine of Cardinal van Rooy, which largely financed the Flemish section of Louvain's university. You know, Louvain is the city next to where I live, a few kilometers from here. The printing house standard today they call it just the standard. Uh, it is written here standard, but it means in English standard, was making sure its presses were kept working by printing the most collaborationist appeals of the VNV, which stands for Flamsch, or Flams Nationalist Verbond, or Flemish National Union. Very soon the business was rolling in money. Being, and I scrapped the two, 100% Catholic, because 200% doesn't exist, being 100% Catholic and a pillar of the Church in Flanders, the leaders of Standard would not have considered collaborating unless the Cardinal had first given his blessing to it clearly and distinctly. Quote, the same was said about the whole of the Catholic press. Unquote. All these efforts were aiming at nothing less than Belgium's breakup, as we are reminded by another Catholic writer, Monsieur Gaston Gaillard. Quote, the Flemish speaking Catholics and the autonomous Catholics of the Alzac justified their attitude by their tacit support always given to the Germanic propaganda by the Holy See. When they referred to the memorable letter sent by Antichrist Pope Pius XI to his Secretary of State, Cardinal Gaspari, on the 26th of June 1923, they were easily convinced that their politics had the approval of Rome, and, of course, Rome did nothing to persuade them otherwise. Had not the Nuncio Pacelli, or Eugenio Pacelli, the future Pope Pius XII, ably supported German nationalists and encouraged the so-called oppressed population of High Silesia? Had not the autonomous plots of Alsac, Eupen, Malmedy and Silesia received ecclesiastical approval which had, not been, uh, which had not always been given discreetly? It was then easy for the Flemish to hide their deeds against Belgium's unity and behind Roman directives." Unquote. You know, Belgium is a country that has always tried to split up between the Flemish and the Val Wallonian people. The Wallonian are in the south of the country speaking French and the Flemish are in the northern part of the country speaking Dutch, Netherlands. And this discussion about splitting up or not is still going on today. Huh? Everybody wants to unite the world and all make one, but the Belgians are fighting to get split between the Dutch and 
the, the Dutch speaking part, the Netherlands speaking part and the French speaking part, the Wallons and the Flemish and that has been already there and that has been there so from the beginning because Belgium is a artificial country, it is not a country founded by culture like for example Germany or Italy or Spain but it's a artificial country. Also, the author continues, in 1942, Pope Pius XII asked his nunciature in Berlin to convey his condolences to Paris on the death of Cardinal Baudrillard, so signifying that he considered the annexation of northern France by Germany as a fact. It also confirmed once again the tacit support always given to the Germanic expansion by the Holy See and himself in particular. Today we can but scornfully smile when we see the Jesuits of His Holiness quibble over something so obvious and repudiate all complicity with the fifth column they themselves had organized, and especially with de Grey. As for him, de Grey safely kept in his refuge, as he knows too much, he can recollect at leisure the famous verses of Ovid. Quote, Donne eris Felix, multos munerabis amicos, tempora si fuerent nubila, solos eris, which means in English, as long as you will be happy, you will have many friends. When the clouds appear, you will be alone. I'm going to show you another picture of Le Gre, so this is not this one, who we have seen last time, yeah, Leon de Grel and the Rexist party, of whom this, um, <laughs> uh, as he said, that uh, he can recollect at leisure the famous verse of Ovid, as long as you will be happy, you will have many friends. When the clouds appear, you will be alone. Yeah, isn't that in real life that way? You know, from when, when you are alone and when you are in need, then you need your friends. Well, and then count how many real friends you have. Huh? We smile when we read the following from Arpe Fessar, who was a Jesuit. Quote, In 1916 and 1917 we waited for the American reinforcements with so much impatience. In 1939 we sadly realized that, even after war had been declared, Hitler was looked upon favorably by a large part of American opinion, even and especially by Catholics. In 1942 and 19 for, uh, 1941 and 1942 we wondered again if the United States would or would not intervene. I quote from Libre Meditation sur un message de pied douze, uh, meaning free meditation on a message of Pius XII's uh, published in Paris 1957. This was a quote from, you know. Um, in 1941 and 1942, we wondered again if the United States would or would not intervene. <laughs> in the First World War, they had to sink the Lusitania and the Americans came in. And in the Second World War, they had to start Pearl Harbor and the Americans came in. That was not the plan from the beginning? Of course it was, because the more Protestant soldiers can be put to war, the more sacrifice the Roman Catholic Church will get. And that's the point all about it, because I told you, they are religious wars. Yeah? There's no way that anything of this was not planned. It was all planned the way it went. Everything. So, <coughs> we read on, it seems, the Good Father, <laughs> or Godfather, viewed the results obtained in America by his own Jesuitical brothers with sadness. Now we are speaking about Pope Pius XII. For, and this is an historical fact, the quote-unquote Christian Front, a Catholic movement opposed to the United States intervention, was directed by Jesuit Father Coughlin, a notorious pro-Hitlerite. Now, Jesuit Father Coughlin, I have a picture here, and that he is, called Monsignor Charles Edward Coughlin. This pious organization lacked nothing and received from Berlin a plentiful supply of propaganda material prepared by Goebbels' office. 
quote, through his publication Social Justice and radio broadcasts, the Jesuit Father Kavlin, here in picture, apostle of the swastika, reached a vast public. He also looked after secret commando cells in the main urban centers, led according to the Sons of Loyola's methods and trained by Nazi agents. Unquote. A secret document of the Wilhelmstrasse clarifies the following point. And what is the Wilhelmstrasse? For the people who do not know, the Wilhelmstrasse is a synonym for, like we have Downing Street in England, speaking of the seat of the government, as you can probably say, Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington DC. You don't use that in the United States of America, that address, but in, uh, in Europe it is quite common that you refer to where the government is seated, the street, like Downing Street, you probably heard that, then we're always speaking about the Prime Minister of Great Britain. And Wilhelmstrasse was a reference to the seat of the government of Germany in Berlin. So a secret document, document of the Wilhelmstrasse clarifies the following point. Quote, Studying the evolution of anti-Semitism in the United States, we note that the number of listeners to the radio broadcasts of Father Kavlin, well known for his anti-Semitism, exceeds 20 millions. Unquote. So, what's he doing? He is teaching anti-Semitism, meaning he is against the Jews. And do you think it is a uh, coincidence uh, that um, people in the United States of America did not leave Jewish refugees into the country? Like they didn't do in England, like they didn't do in any other country? That was to support the quote-unquote Holocaust that happened. Huh? And also in the United States of America you had a very, very Nazi-like government huh? with, in the time, Roosevelt, who was on there. There was almost a Nazi coup in that time. But I don't want to go into that, therefore you have to rely on the historical research that Eric John Phelps did, uh, among uh, others, in his book Vatican Assassins, Wounded in the House of My Friends. Uh, there he speaks about that. And he can tell you how fascist the American government was. So therefore it is no wonder that this Jesuit Father Coughlin here also is like a, uh, a teacher against the Jews. That's what he does, because he is known for his, he is well known for his anti-Semitism. And his listeners reached more than 20 millions. It exceeded 20 millions. Now, I don't know how many uh, people were living in the United States in the 1930s, but it sure was not the 330 millions that we have today. So it was at least, I think, 10%, if not more, of the whole population that listened to this Jesuit father and his propaganda, which was actually the same, as the one that Goebbels spread out in Germany. Huh? Like I said, this pious organization lacked nothing and received from Berlin a plentiful supply of propaganda material prepared by Goebbels' office. So what Goebbels prepares, the Knight of Malta controlled propaganda officer in Germany, Father Coughlin in the United States of America spreads around. The Americans were no better than the Germans. They were all Catholic controlled. It doesn't have to do with anything, like people often think, with nationalities. Because Jesuits who foment the wars have no nationality, have no allegiance but to their superior general. Not even the white pope, no, their superior general. That is the only allegiance they have. No allegiance to no country, no allegiance to no person, to no family, to no nothing but to the general. Now, we have to put here a picture of uh, Edmund A. Walsh, who many of you maybe know, who many, many of you maybe do not know, but Jesuit father Edmund A. Walsh was the founder of the School on Foreign Relations in the Georgetown University. Do some studies on that and you will find out what diabolical person he was. 
we just learn of him now in this book from Edmond Paris, where we read, Must we recall the actions of Jesuit Father Walsh, an agent of the Pope, Dean of the School of Political Sciences at the University of Georgetown, Jesuitic nursery of American diplomacy, and a zealous propagandist of German politics? At that time, the General of the Society of Jesus was, as by chance, Heike von Ledukowski, a former general in the Austrian army. He succeeded Werns, a Prussian, in 1915. Has the RP Fessard also forgotten what La Croix, and this is uh, a magazine, a Catholic magazine in, the, uh, in, in France at the time, which we spoke about earlier already in earlier broadcasts of, on earlier readings of this book, what Lacroix wrote all through the war, and especially this, quote, there is nothing to be gained from an intervention of troops from the other side of the Channel and Atlantic, unquote. <laughs> this is what Lacroix wrote, and they said that there is no advantage to be gained, there is nothing to be gained from an intervention from troops from the other side of the channel means Great Britain, England, and the Atlantic means the United States of America. Well, no, maybe not from the view of the French, but a lot from the view of the Romish, yeah, of the papacy. Does he not remember either his telegram of his holiness, quote-unquote holiness, Antichrist Pope Pius XII, the Pope sends his blessing to La Croix, the voice of pontifical thought. Unquote. <laughs> Considering so much forgetfulness, must we come to the conclusion that members of the Society of Jesus have very short memories? They did not incur this reproach even from their enemies, though. Let us rather point out that Fessar expressed his patriotic fears of 1941-1942 in 1957 only. So he didn't say anything about this quote-unquote patriotic fears earlier. His free meditations over 15 years brought some results and he had time to reread a certain passage of the spiritual exercises which says that, quote, the Jesuit must be ready if the Church declares that what he sees as black is white, to agree with her, even though his senses tell him the opposite, unquote. Yeah, we know that, of course, from the oath of the Jesuits. Yeah? Now, let's go back to the picture of the book reading. I don't want this La Croix time, uh, picture standing there all the time. As far as that is concerned, Fessard seems to be an excellent Jesuit. As far as the dogma concerns that the Jesuit must be ready if the Church declares that what he sees as black is white to agree with her even though his senses tell him the opposite. On the 7th of March 1936, the author continues, Hitler brought the Wehrmacht into the demilitarized Rhine region so tearing up the Pact of Locarno. On the 11th of March 1938, it was the Anschluss, I spoke about that a little bit earlier, the Union of Austria and Germany, and on the 29th of September of the same year, 1938, in Munich, France and England had imposed on them by the Reich the annexation of Sudetenland in Czechoslovakia. That was the German expansion before the war. The Führer had come to power thanks to the votes of the Catholic Zentrum, you remember, Kaas, only five years before, but most of the objectives cynically revealed in Mein Kampf, this book that uh, uh, Adolf Hitler supposedly or allegedly wrote, were already realized. This book, and now listen closely for the ones to whom this is news, this is very, very important, very, very important. Mein Kampf, this book that Adolf Hitler allegedly wrote, an insolent challenge to the Western democracies, was written by the Jesuit father Stempfler and signed by Hitler. So Hitler did not write that book, he only signed for that book. You can find more information on the website 
as you can see here www.spirituallysmart.com slash nazi.html but you will find it anywhere when you go to that website that website um, I just forgot the name of the of, of the guy who runs it I think it's uh, Richards is his name I'm not sure he has done wonderful research on that now <laughs> What you can see, I, I don't know if you can read this, this is fine enough that you can read it, but I'm going to read it to you. In June 1934, having been deported to the Dachau concentration camp, the body of Jesuit father Stempfler was found in the woods near Harlaching. His death is attributed to some accounts to a broken neck and by others to shots in the heart while trying to escape. There is disagreement also over the reasons of this murder. Well, I'm going to tell you what the reasons are. The Jesuit father Stempfler, who wrote the book Mein Kampf, which is accredited to Adolf Hitler, he was the real writer of this book. Hitler just signed it and just stood for it, but he didn't write it. Hitler was even too dumb to write a book. The point is that he knew too much. And when he had done his work, he was done away with. How can I say this in confidence? Because we have read already a few uh, chapters before, as you probably remember, the story about uh, Erzberger, you know, the German propaganda minister during the First World War, and then the Reichsminister in the uh, Weimar Republic, who prepared with this book on the memories of the war, where he published um, the preparations of the Lateran Treaty in 1929, how they wanted to make the Vatican a state again and give back the Pope his political and with that civil power in this world. Erzberger, Matthias was his name, Matthias Erzberger. Remember me reading that? And when he knew too much, what was done with him in 1921 when all, when all was said and done? He was done away with, he was assassinated, he was killed. Father Stempfle, the same thing. Father Stempfle was killed can believe me you cannot believe me I don't care but the point is that when these people have done their jobs they are often just done away with you know um, we have in Flemish the saying the moor is then werke dan the moor can gaan means uh, the moor uh, a word that you also use in English you write it different but you understand that has done his work now we can go he is dismissed where is he dismissed to well there where he cannot say anything about that was the agenda from the beginning anymore because he knows too much and who knows too much has to be made silent and that is why Bernhard Stempfle was made silent there are a lot of people who think that even Adolf Hitler escaped to the south of uh, America Argentina through the lead lines and everything I'm not so sure but uh, I will read uh, the real Odessa from uh, Guri uh, within a time and uh, then I will look more into that but uh, I think he doesn't even deal with Hitler but he deals with all the other Nazi crime war criminals like Mengele and Eichmann and all these guys who have been uh, done uh, who have been brought to the south of America after the Second World War but I'm not going into that right now but I just want to tell you when you're working for the Jesuit agenda on a high level like Bernhard Stempfle, well, don't be surprised that when your work is done, they see you as done also and they don't go into risking having you any more around and maybe starting to sing of the secrets that they want to still keep quiet. Okay? Now, Let's continue in the book here then. I'm going to repeat this last sentence because it's very important. I mean, to me it's old news, but to maybe a lot of you it is still news that Mein Kampf, this book, an insolent challenge to the Western democracies, was written by Jesuit Father Stempfle and signed by Hitler. For, as so many ignore the fact, it was the Society of Jesus which perfected the famous pan-German program as laid out in this book, and the Führer just endorsed it. With this bomb, <laughs> I can only almost say, with this bombshell in this book reading, we come to the end of this uh, chapter, of this part, 
We will next time continue in Section 5, Chapter 3, German Aggressions and the Jesuits, Austria, Poland, Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia. But not for today, because for today we will turn to a book that is called The Secret Terrorists. Okay? And I'm going to put out the picture right here, though Soviet Jews can see the cover. This book was written by Bill Hughes in uh, 2003, 4, 5, something about that time. Um, his uh, lectures of Behind the Door that I have on my second YouTube channel, um, that you can find, in the meantime they are all uploaded, all 55 parts, uh, deal a lot with the stuff that is in this book. And his book, uh, The Secret Terrorists, is quite interesting. And why am I reading that right now? Well, we have had in the secret history of the Jesuits the approach of the Second World War. Yeah? Everything that was preceding the Second World War. And we are going into that uh, in a few more sessions during the reading of that book. But chapter 7 of this book, The Secret Terrorists, is about 8 pages long. And it only deals with that and without much commenting, I promise that, <laughs> without much commenting, I just want to read that to you. Because this is more like, if you compare the two books, Bill Hughes makes more of a summary of the Second World War here than Edmond Paris. Edmond Paris writes over 30, 40 pages about the subject and Bill Hughes about 8 pages. That is interesting in that kind because here we get in a very short time very dense information about the Second World War. Now what you will see is that I highlighted uh, the quotes in this book so I will not go into explaining anything of the sources because the book The Secret Terrorist by Bill Hughes like the book The Secret History of um, Edmond Paris like all the other books that I'm reading are absolutely documented. Yeah? And uh, I do not go into the different sources of the book. Like here we have Edmond Paris, who wrote The Secret History of the Jesuits, of his other book, The Vatican Against Europe. He wrote multiple books against or <coughs> on the Vatican, on the information on the Vatican. I will not go into these quotes. You can see that by the highlight for yourself, and you can look it up for yourself if you don't believe what Bill Yu says here or what I read to you and I try to make this work within the next half hour but I don't think that will <laughs> very much succeed so let's see how far we get I just wanted to do this in one video but as I said I will not comment I will keep my comments for the reading and the continual reading of the secret history of the, Jesu uh, of, yeah, of the Jesuits I will not comment within this chapter 7 of the secret terrorist by Bill Hughes which deals about World War Two, Yeah, one comment I have to make here, as you can see that, of course. But let's see what Bill Hughes in the book The Secret Terrorists has to say about World War Two. Quote, World War Two was the most extensive and devastating war in recorded history. The author says hundreds of thousands of people died in this war, and I said no, more than 60 millions. That's a lot more than hundreds of thousands. 60 million, more than 60 million. Some numbers go 66, some numbers go even beyond 70 million. I don't know. Every life counts. Every life counts. Doesn't matter if that's 50 million or 50 people. Every murder is one too much. And war is nothing else but state sponsored murder. Yeah? Killing. By allowance of the state. Whereas God says, thou shalt not kill. Okay? I'm not going to start the moral teaching right now, because you all know my standpoint on that, and you probably have as a Christian the same standpoint. But hundreds of thousands of people died in this war, Bill Yu says in the beginning of his chapter 7 on the secret terrorists. Millions and millions and tens of millions even died. Most people have no idea why this war was fought or what the cause of this war was. Yeah, I have to make a little comment here. It's the same with Vietnam. 
the same with Vietnam. And if you want to know why the war in Vietnam happened, read Avril Manhattan's book, Vietnam, Why Did We Go? It's also on my to-read list for the future. But I'm going to stop making comments, otherwise I don't keep my promise that I made to you. Most people have no idea why this war was fought, or what the cause of this war, the Second World War, was. Wars do not just happen. They are planned and executed by people high in governments for their own advantage. President Franklin D. Roosevelt said, quote, In politics, nothing, absolutely nothing happens by accident. If it happens, you can bet it was planned that way. Unquote. Let us take a look at who planned World War II. Popes and their Jesuitical agents have been and are the instigators of war, and while the world is having real pain, Rome is having champagne. Another quote, the Pope was just as much in the Second World War as was Hitler and Catholic Mussolini, and therefore just as guilty of the murder of six million Jews. In fact, popes have been or instigated most, if not all, the European wars down through the centuries. Unquote. And the next quote, as you can see here from Edmund Paris's book, quote, One may say quite specifically that in 1914 the Roman Church started the series of hellish wars. It was then that the tribute of blood which she, ha which she has always taken from the peoples began to swell into a veritable torrent." Unquote. These are not the only reputable authors who implicate the papacy as the instigators of World War II as well as all other wars. In light of these statements, it is sickening to hear of a recent meeting held in Assisi, Italy, where Antichrist Pope John Paul II was quoted as saying, quote, Violence never again, war never again, terrorism never again. Unquote. The papacy has instigated and is still instigating wars, and the Pope has the audacity to make that statement. America is currently conducting a war on terrorism. The above statements indicate that the papacy is responsible for making this war on terrorism necessary. The above statements indicate that the papacy is responsible for making this war on terrorism necessary. George Bush declared in USA Today on September 7, 2001 that his administration is preparing a crusade against terrorism. Yeah, and even though that I don't want to put out any pictures, just let me uh, show you there is a quote from George Bush when he said, This crusade, this war on terrorism is going to take a while. Well, let me have a quick look if I can find the MP3 here. Uh, Bush Crusade quote, I think, oh, this, those are pictures or what? Um, listen to this. Um, that these evildoers still exist. We haven't seen this kind of barbarism in a long period of time. No one could have conceivably imagined uh, suicide bombers burrowing into our society and then emerging all on the same day to fly their aircraft, fly U.S. aircraft into buildings full of innocent people and show no remorse. And uh, we're, we're, this is a new kind of, uh, a new kind of evil. And uh, we all, we'll, uh, we understand. And the American people are beginning to understand. Now this is, this, 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 this crusade, this crusade, this crusade, this war on terrorism, this crusade, this crusade, this crusade uh, is going to take a while. 
Mr. President, final question. Yes, sir. You said famously, when you looked into Vladimir Putin's eyes, you saw his soul. Yeah. When you look into Benedict XVI's eyes, what do you see? God. When you look into Benedict XVI's eyes, what do you see? God. So that was a small excursion. And showing you this picture and letting you hear the audio of George W. Bush himself can maybe even the people convince who did not believe that George Bush was playing the Pope's card and is playing the Pope's game. Was playing the Pope's game and is playing the Pope's game. As Bill Yu says here correctly in his book, The Secret Terrorist, George Bush declared in USA Today and in the interview that you've just heard on September 17, 2001, that his administration is preparing a crusade against terrorism. In past history, crusades were religious wars fought on behalf of papal interests. Was President Bush telling us that his war on terrorism is being fought to further papal interests? Good question, huh? What's your answer to that? Adolf Hitler was guilty of all kinds of atrocities during Second World War. Was he really responsible for these atrocities? Or was he simply carrying out orders? Consider who was pulling the strings in Hitler's Germany. Quote, in Germany, the papal nuncio in Berlin, Monsignore Eugenio Pacelli and Franz von Papen, privy chamberlain to the Pope, advocated a, quote, union with Rome, unquote, and concentrated on the overthrow of the Weimar Republic. The German Catholics were hostile to Nazism, but were informed that the Pope himself was favorably disposed towards Hitler. Consequently, the Catholic Centrum axis of all parliamentary majorities voted full rights to Hitler on January 30th, 1933. This operation was promptly followed, as in Italy, by the concluding of a concordat which was most advantageous to the Roman Church. The German Episcopate swore allegiance to the Führer, and Catholic youth organizations combined with those of the Nazis. Unquote. The Vatican helped Hitler to gain power and then helped him consolidate his grip on Germany. This was done in party, with, uh, in party by advising the Catholic Party of Germany to vote for Nazi candidates. The Catholic vote gave Hitler the majority he needed to legally form a government in 1933. Further to this, the Vatican ordered Catholic members of the Reichstag Parliament to support legislation giving Hitler the power to rule by decree. This measure gave Hitler the dictatorial power he needed to destroy the German Communists. Now just a very small comment of mine. Further to this, the Vatican ordered Catholic members of the Reichstag Parliament to support legislation giving Hitler the power to rule by decree. The United States of America is ruled by executive orders. Where's the difference? Wake up, people! There is none! The president that you elect every four years is the same dictator as Hitler was. He is just hidden under the face of democracy behind elections where you think that you have really the power to elect someone you want, you always elect the candidate of the Pope. And he then rules by executive orders. That's the same when Hitler got power to rule by decree. Wake up! The Fourth Reich is not coming, it's already long time there. You only have to see it. This measure gave Hitler the dictatorial power he needed to destroy the German communists. And this measure gave the American president the dictatorial powers he needed to destroy American protestants. How does that read? Huh? The whole Vatican Hitler bargain had been conducted in secret before Hitler became Chancellor of Germany in January 1933. 
In June of the same year, Hitler and the Vatican signed a concordat on the terms of which he, the Church swore allegiance to the Nazi regime. Soon afterward, Catholic Franz von Papen, the second in command to Hitler and Knight of Malta, put the essence of the Hitler-Vatican alliance very succinctly in these words. Quote, the Third Reich, he said, is the first power which not only recognizes but puts into practice the high principles of the papacy. Now I'm going to put this a little bit bigger that you can read it very easily. The Third Reich, in the highlighted part, is the first power which not only recognizes but puts into practice the high principles of the papacy. That is a statement from a knight of Malta, Avro Manhattan, uh, <laughs> Franz von Papen, in Avro Manhattan's book, The Vatican Moscow Washington Alliance. What an amazing statement that is. Von Papen says that the atrocities that Hitler perpetrated during the Second World War were the principles of the papacy. Can there be any doubt that the papacy is just as evil as was Hitler and his regime? Quote, Hitler himself admits that he was helped by the methods of the Jesuit counter-reformation to carry on his ideological war. We have witnessed Catholicism's open support of every step taken by Nazi fascism to impose authoritarian regimes upon all peoples. This is from Behind the Dictators. And you can find a playlist of that name on my channel where I read the complete book of Leo Herbert Lehman, which is quoted here. An accurate account of history places the Catholic Jesuit menace at the very heart of the Hitler regime. It was Catholic von Papen and the Catholic Zentrum Party that got Hitler into power in 1933 and to show his gratitude, Hitler's Third Reich was a model of papal principles at their worst. Hitler was merely a pawn in the hands of the Jesuits of the papacy. Who supported Hitler in war-ravaged Germany? Remember, Germany had been reduced to rags by World War I and the Hyannis Treaty of Versailles. And remember, before I continue, the quote that I read to you from Marshal Fock, the supreme uh, commander of the Allied forces of World War I, when he stated, this is not a peace treaty, this is a 20-year truce or armistice in 1919. Quote from the Federal Reserve Bank by H. S. Keenan, quote, Immense sums belonging to our national bank depositors have been given to Germany on no collateral security whatever. Billions upon billions of our money has been pumped into Germany by the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks. On April 27, 1932, the Federal Reserve outfit sends $750,000 belonging to American bank depositors in gold to Germany. A week later, another $300,000 in gold was shipped to Germany in the same way. About the middle of May, $12 million in gold was shipped to Germany by the Federal Reserve Banks. Almost every week there is a shipment of gold to Germany." Unquote. Now, we, have, we saw in the previous chapter of this book, that's why you should read the whole book, The Secret Terrorist by Bill Hughes, the Federal Reserve Bank was a creation of the Jesuits. They use it to finance their insane puppets like Adolf Hitler. Kennan states that the Federal Reserve financed Hitler and the Nazis. If the Federal Reserve Bank is controlled and run by Americans, how could it finance a deadly enemy like Hitler, who stood for everything that the Constitution condemns? In light of Kennan's statement, of the Federal Reserve Bank is not American. It's our enemy. It's financing our enemies. Thus, it makes sense that the Jesuit-controlled bank would fund a Jesuit-controlled puppet like Adolf Hitler. From Jesuit-controlled Germany under Hitler, let us turn to the country of Spain and Francisco Franco. Spain was going through convulsions toward the end of the 1800s. 
She went back and forth between a Roman Catholic monarchy and an attempt at free Republican government. Finally, in the 1930s, bodies of babies were discovered under several convents in Spain. Doctors discovered that these infants had died as the result of suffocation. You see, nuns and priests had engaged in adultery, and the unwanted babies were killed at birth. The Catholic people of Spain, who knew nothing of these awful crimes, were outraged by the discoveries, and many laws were passed that hindered the papacy's power in Spain. According to ex-Jesuit Alberto Rivera, we read, quote, In 1936 the new Spanish Inquisition exploded. It was called the Spanish Civil War, secretly orchestrated in the Vatican. And by the way, Mussolini of Ital Italy and Hitler of Germany supported that war. I think we read about that earlier in the Secret History of the Jesuits by sending material, war material and personnel, soldiers. The quote continues, the Pope co excommunicated the heads of the Spanish Republic and declared war between the Holy See and Madrid. Under the banner of the Vatican, the Muslim forces invaded the Canary Islands and then attacked southern Spain. When the Inquisition accomplished its goals, Spain was in ruins, bleeding and beaten, but safely back, safely back in the arms of the devil or the Vatican, which is the same. General Franco eventually became the Roman Catholic dictator in Spain. Franco's government was recognized August 3, 1937 by the Vatican, just 20 months before the Civil War ended." Unquote. Another quote. When Franco marched on Madrid, nearing the close of the late Civil War in Spain, when he was reinstating the Catholic government and overthrowing the people's governments the Protestants had set up a few years before, he said, quote, I have four columns of soldiers with me. I also have a fifth column in the city of Madrid, who will betray the city into my hands when I get there." Unquote. On March 31st, another quote continues, 1934 the Pact of Rome was signed and pledged support of Mussolini and Hitler for the rebellion. The Holy War broke out. In 1937, in the midst of war, the Vatican gave de jure recognition to the government of Franco, its sword-bearer, who was later to be decorated with the Supreme Order of Christ. Quote, Blessed be the guns if the gospel flowers in their wake. Unquote. Soon the Catholic action was to spread its tyranny across the ruined country. Pax Christi. Now I read to you this term de jure and there are a lot of people who don't understand that so let me explain that to you. In law and government de jure, Latin in for in law, describes practices that are legally recognized whether or not the practices exist in reality. In contrast to de jure you have de facto, mean in fact or in practice and describes situations that exist in reality, even if not locally, uh, legally recognized. The terms are often used to contrast different scenarios. For a colloquial example, quote, I know that de jure this is supposed to be a parking lot, but now that the flood has left four feet wa of water here, it is de facto a swimming pool. Now this is interesting because the Roman Catholic Church likes to use these terms, de jure and de facto. And for example, I give you another example. The government of the United States of, uh, of America is a de facto government, but not a de jure government in the eyes of the Vatican. Maybe you understand it like this way too. But let's continue in the, in the book The Secret Terrorists by Bill Hughes. Benito Mussolini, he says, was highly esteemed by the Jesuits of Rome. He was their man of providence who restored Vatican City to the papacy in 1929 with the Lateran Accord, with Lateran Treaty, right? 
And now with the following quote, you have to watch the previous video of this reading, The Secret History of the Jesuits, for a deeper understanding. What was happening in Europe between the two massacres? In Italy, secret negotiations took place between papal agents and Mussolini, the man of providence. The priest Don Sturzo, chief of the Catholic group, had full rights voted to the Duce on November 1922. Then came the Lateran Treaty to seal the union of fascism and the papacy, the conquest of Ethiopia, blessed by the clergy, and, on Good Friday 1939, the aggression against Albania. Unquote. According to Antichrist Pope Pius XI, quote, Mussolini is making rapid headway and, with elemental strength, will conquer all in his path. Mussolini is a wonderful man. Do you hear me? A wonderful man. The future is his. Unquote. This are the words of a Pope. Mussolini, a fascist dictator, is a wonderful man. The quote continues, For today Rome considers the fascist regime the nearest to its dogmas and interest. You remember when I read to you the quote from Civilta Cattolica, uh, the Jesuit house organ on fascism? Go back a few videos onto the last video and read that and you have confirmation of what Bill Hughes cites here from the book Pierre van Parsen in Days of Our Years. For today, he says, Rome considers the fascist regime the nearest to its dogmas and interest. We have not merely the reverend Jesuit father Kavlin, as we saw already a picture of him earlier, praising Mussolini's Italy as a Christian democracy, but Civilta Cattolica, house organ of the Jesuits, says quite frankly, fascism is the regime that corresponds most closely to the concepts of the Church of Rome. Unquote. Like I just was referring to, I, I should have just read on. No comment, Jörg, just read on. We'll get through this. We read a previous quote that said that Hitler put into practice the ruthless principles of the papacy. Now we see that Mussolini did the same thing. It wasn't just the three axis power of Europe with their Catholic puppets what did Rome bidding during World War that did Rome's bidding during World War II. Franklin Roosevelt, President of the United States, also carried out Rome's wishes. Cardinal Spellman was offered an unprecedented opportunity by Roosevelt that would necessitate leaving his archdiocese for months on end. The astounding proposal Roosevelt put forth was that Spellman act as a clandestine agent for him in the four corners of the world. It would be the Archbishop's job to contact chiefs of state in the Middle East, Europe, Asia and Africa. He would carry messages for the President and act as Roosevelt's eyes and ears. The president offered him an opportunity to wield more power than any other American religious figure had ever had. Spellman would move as an equal among the greatest figures on the world political stage. But few people were certain about what the archbishop did during his far-flung travels. His clandestine work raised questions at home about the role of a religious figure involved deeply in governmental affairs. And there is so much more to say about Spellman, but this is not a video about Spellman, this is the continuation of the reading The Secret History of the Jesuits with an excursion into the book from Bill Hughes, The Secret Terrorists. And I'm gonna continue. Spellman's first allegiance was to Pope Pius XII, to the Antichrist, and yet he was used by Franklin Roosevelt as his own personal agent. Of Roosevelt we read again, quote, Roosevelt and Eisenhower approved of the forced repatriation of some six million Orthodox Christian people back to Russia, many of whom were tortured or killed after they reached their destination. Two Russians who have written about this abominable decision by these American leaders are Nikolai Tolstoy and Alexandra Solzhenitsyn. The Americans called this repatriation. 
Operation Keel Hall after the naval form of torture, where the prisoner is hauled under the keel of a ship by a rope tied to the prisoner's body to be severely cut by the barnacles of the bottom of the ship. The Americans called this repatri repatriation Operation Keel Hall. Six million Orthodox Christian died. Six million Orthodox Catholics, but nevertheless, people. These six million individuals were not only soldiers who had fought on the side of Germans against the Russians, but they were women and children as well. Even though it was Churchill and Roosevelt who made the incredible decision to send millions of anti-communist Russians back to certain death, it was General Dwight Eisenhower who enforced Operation Keelhole with no apparent pangs of conscience. Unquote. Roosevelt not only used Spellman, Cardinal Spellman, as his agent, but he carried out the Jesuits' goal of annihilating as many Orthodox Catholics as possible. The Jesuits sought to destroy the Orthodox Christians of, Ger of Serbia in World War I. See earlier reading on the subject in the book. And with this repatriation at the end of World War II, they destroyed many more millions of Russian Orthodox Catholics. Roosevelt, Eisenhower and Churchill carried out the Jesuits' bloody plan with considerable success. Quote, Jesuit General Count Halke von Lerakowski was disposed to organize on the common basis of anti-communism a certain degree of collaboration between the German secret service and the Jesuit order. Von Ledokowski considered the forthcoming bellicose settling of accounts between Russia and Germany as inevitable. And the Basler Nachrichten, uh, which is uh, the news of Basel, from March 27, 1942, did not hesitate to write, quote, One of the questions arising from German activity in Russia which is of supreme importance to the Vatican, is the question of the evangelization of Russia. Unquote. Evangelization, read Catholicization. Huh? Now this is confirmed by Father Duclos himself in a book covered by the imprimatur. During the summer of 1941, it quotes, Hitler appealed to all Christian forces. He authorized Catholic missionaries to go to the new eastern territories. Nor has it been forgotten that in France Cardinal Baudrillard and Monseigneur Mayol de Loup recruited the LVF for the crusade against Russia. Unquote. While the Orthodox Christians of Russia were being exterminated by the papacy, there was a similar massacre going on in Yugoslavia. Some of the many books that have been written about this atrocity of World War II include Convert or Die. Some of the many books that have been written about this atrocity of World War II include Convert or Die, a book by Edmond Paris, The Vatican's Holocaust by Avro Manhattan and Reveling Wolves by Monica Farrell. These books all discuss the murder of around one million Orthodox Catholics during World War II by the Catholic Ustashi. On the cover of Farrell's book we read this is the record of torture and murder committed in Europe in 1941 through 1943 by an army of Catholic actionists known as the Eustachi, led by Dominican monks and priests and even participated in by nuns. The victims suffered and died in the cause of liberty and freedom of conscience. The least we can do is to read the record of their sufferings and keep in mind that it happened not in the Dark Ages, but in our own enlightened generation. Eustachi is another name for Catholic action. Unquote from Monica Farrell. And another quote reads, The mass expulsion of forced conversion of the Orthodox Catholics to Roman Catholicism was on the agenda. All measures aiming at the elimination of serfdom in Croatia were carried out under the slogan enunciated by one of the Croatian ministers, quote, 
we shall massacre the first third of the Serbs, expel the second third from the country, and force the final third to accept the Catholic faith, the Roman Catholic faith, whereby they will be absorbed by the Catholic element. Unquote. The papacy was still trying to exterminate Orthodox Catholics in Serbia in the late 1990s. The papacy used the United States as their bully in that conflict to bomb Serbia. The real butcher of the Balkans is the Pope and the Catholic Church, not Slobodan Milosevic. They are trying the wrong person for war crimes. As always, they commit the crimes and put somebody else to take the blame. Another Jesuit goal of World War II was to make things so bad for the Jewish race, for the Jewish race that they would want to return to Palestine. Near the end of World War I, the Balfour Declaration was signed enabling the Jews to go back home to Palestine. This was to be their permanent home. However, many Jews had found success in various parts of the world and did not want to return. When World War II and the Jewish Holocaust occurred, the persecuted Jews longed for a place to call home and many returned to Palestine. In 1948, Israel was declared to be a sovereign nation. According to Cooney's book, the American Pope, on page 187, Francis Spellman had been the deciding factor in getting Israel accepted as a sovereign state. Now I wrote a comment here and I really have to get into that. I don't care that we are about one hour, I will finish the reading of the Sikh of Terrorists, this is chapter 7, and this comment has to be read to you here. I will here not go deeper into this. I have done this extensively before the founding of the nation state of Israel. Watch the two videos from Nothing But The Truth, The Greatest Deception Since The Garden Of Eden, to understand that all this, the founding of the nation state of Israel, is just the agenda to take the reformational and biblical spotlight off the papacy as being the biblical, historical and prophetic Antichrist. The deception of the diabolical teaching of Daniel's incomplete 70-week prophecy, which has been fulfilled by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. The salvation of the Jews is the same as it is for the Gentiles. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18, we read from the King James Bible, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. You don't need a nation state of Israel. You only need grace. Whether you're Jew or you're Gentile, there is no need for a nation state of Israel in these times. The only reason that state is there is because of the unfulfilled 70th week of Daniel teaching by the Jesuits um, yeah, by the Jesuit order um, Francisco Raibira was his name in 1590 he came out with that and then of course you had Cardinal Bellarmine and many other people who sing the same song and today nobody recognizes the papacy as the Antichrist anymore therefore there has to be a state of Israel and a third temple to be built. But as I said, I will not go deeper into this. I've done this extensively before. Watch the two videos, The Greatest Deception Since the Garden of Eden and Satan's Paradise, The Consequences of Not Understanding the Greatest Deception Since the Garden of Eden and the playlist, Nothing But the Truth. And uh, of course, watch any video from Tom Fress from Inquisition Update um, or a lot of my videos even to get a further understanding of this. But this Cardinal Francis Spellman, the American Pope, had been the deciding factor in getting Israel accepted as a sovereign nation state. Why would the Jesuits use Hitler to annihilate the Jews and then have Jesuit Cardinal Francis Spellman provide a home in Palestine for them? Watch carefully. 
the Vatican has sought to destroy the Jews for more than a thousand years. Quote, Behind the Zionist banner there was to be found the ancient messianic hope for the coming of a global theocracy, as predicted by all the seers and prophets of Zion. It was to be a theocracy in which Jehovah, not Christ, was to be king. The specter of the creation of such a theocracy has haunted the inner chambers of the Catholic Church from her earliest inception and still is a dominant fear. In Vatican eyes, therefore, the millen uh, millenarian yearning for a global Hebrew theocracy represents a deadly threat to the eschatological teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. When translated into concrete political terms, such a, uh, such a view spells not only rivalry, but implacable enmity. Unquote. And there you have the reason why the Roman Catholic Church does not think to can exist next to the Jews. Therefore, they have to be annihilated. On the surface of the nation of Israel and Palestine seemed to be a grand opportunity for the Jews to be able to have their own country. However, what was being the result of the Jews returning to Palestine? Since they were granted sovereign status in 1948, the Jews have been in one ravaging battle after another with the Arabs. Many Jews have died, just as the Jesuits hoped and knew would happen. You know how I often refer to Israel as the greatest concentration camp, and this is further proof of that. With the Jews return to Israel and Palestine, the Jesuits hoped to cause such bloodshed in that part of the world that the world would cry out for a peacemaker to come to the region. And who would be that pace or peacemaker? The Pope of Vatican City, of course the Antichrist of the Bible all along. The Jesuits have long wanted to restore the Pope's temporal power when the Pope is given Solomon's throne in Jerusalem. The long-awaited goal will be accomplished. The war on terrorism that originated on September 11, 2001, which George Bush calls a crusade, could certainly aggravate the trouble in that region to bring about the reign of the Pontiff from Jerusalem. The Jesuits failed in their attempts to have a world-governing body following World War I. They accomplished their sinister goal after World War II. Following the war, the weary, aching world was conditioned to accept an international government and the United Nations was born. Since the creation of the United Nations in 1945, this so-called peacekeeping body has failed miserably in keeping peace around the world. Why? Because keeping peace is not their purpose, even though they continue to claim that it is. There are presently some 83 different wars around the world. However, it has certainly been instrumental in suppressing liberty-loving people. Katanga and Rhodesia are just two examples of nations crushed by United Nations forces. The United Nations has worked tirelessly to restore the temporal power of the papacy, its purpose from the beginning. We will look at one more of the Jesuits' purposes for World War II. It was payback time for the Japanese. In the late 1500s, the Japanese, as read and discussed in another chapter of the secret history of the Jesuits, had welcomed all foreigners who wanted to trade with her. Catholic missionaries had been welcomed too. After a time, the Catholic missionaries became intolerant of all other beliefs. Unrest and persecution resulted and Japan became a bloodbath for many decades. Finally, in 1639, the exclusion edict was passed. It stated, quote, For the future, let none, so long as the sun illuminates the world, presume to sail to Japan, not even the quality of ambassadors, and this declaration is never to be revoked on pain of death." Unquote. For nearly 200 years, the ports of Japan were closed to Jesuit missionaries, who had sought to take over Japan for the proud Pope. Through the latter half of the 19th century, military power was used against the island nation. 
This softened in her until the awful bloody conflict of World War II in the South Pacific, culminating in the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Japan was brought to her knees forever. Payback had come. And with this I will conclude my reading today on the secret history of the Jesuits from Edmond Paris with an insert of the secret terrorists from Bill Hughes on World War II. And we will continue next time in the book The Secret History of the Jesuits. I thank you all for watching and listening, even though it was a little bit more than an hour, 75 minutes, but I hope that I got your attention. And if I didn't get your attention, then please pause the video, put it in the playlist to watch later, or watch it again. But avail yourselves of this information given to you freely by author Edmund Paris on the one hand, Bill Hughes on the other hand, and do your own research. You saw the highlighted sources in the book. Read them for yourself. Get these books. Read this. Read the Bible and understand the Bible. And you will see that there is no conspiracy theory. But there is all conspiracy facts. You just have to get to the bottom of it. With this... Jörg from Juggle 66, Hour of the Truth says, God bless you, signing off and bye bye. A special I work um, in dealing with the infiltration of churches and religious institutions as well as government. Uh, that, that cover a tremendous uh, number of institutions. And the purpose of that infiltration was. What for? Well, the purpose is what the Roman Catholic system has all the time as, a, as her own purpose, is to infiltrate, to penetrate all the areas of life where the Ro Roman Catholic can have control and access for the coming world government. Simply put, this country and this world benefit from your commitment to Jesuit principles, to being men. As a graduate of another great Jesuit institution, Xavier University, I have great affection for the value and purpose of a Jesuit education. What that means is in preparation for that world government, the Roman Catholic institution, especially since the establishment of the Jesuit order in 1541, throughout all these 500 years, they've been in preparation in and, and through infiltration and penetration of every uh, level uh, of society in order to uh, take over uh, the world uh, politically and religiously. What a beautiful day the Lord has made. Holy Father, on behalf of Michelle and myself, welcome to the White House. There are two doctrines that define very well these, uh, these dangerous goals of the Roman Catholic institution. Two doctrines uh, define this very well. One is called the doctrine of the apostolic succession, and that is dealing with the papacy. And the other is the doctrine of the temporal power, and that is dealing with world government. Of course, both, because you can see that even the Pope and his own individual office, he meet those requirements. Uh, he is not only the head of his church, as he called himself, John Paul II, the present Pope, he said he is the pastor of his church. He is not only that, uh, but he is the head of his estate. It is a sign, perhaps, of how far we have come in this country that today's news of formal recognition between the governments of the United States and the Vatican did not create a furor. Once upon a time, it would have. Once upon a time, and not all that long ago, it did. From the time of President Washington, there was the first president to be utilized by the Jesuits. If you were not aware of that, President Washington already was initiated by the Jesuits to bring about the first communication with the Vatican ever known in this country. From there on, uh, 
uh, President Reagan, uh, throughout all this time, President Reagan has come to fulfill the greatest, uh, uh, the greatest moment in the history of this conspiracy.